Hi, everyone. Welcome to day three of the From Blank Pages to Writing Machine workshop. Thank you for joining me for another day. I really appreciate you being here or caching the recording if you are uh, watching it after the fact. So let's do a quick recap of day one and two. Let me go ahead and share my screen so we can dive right into it because we have a lot to go over today, which is really exciting. Um, let's see here, share screen. All right, so hopefully you can see this as well. So on day one, we went over how to identify your theme of your book, the guiding light, the overarching message, the purpose of your book in many ways. We talked about knowing your genre, having a baseline pitch to work off of, starting brainstorming ideas, identifying your target audience, and then officially stepping into your author journey and owning it for what it is. And then yesterday, we went over some of my favorite pieces, which had to do with knowing your why, a why that's strong enough to anchor you, to keep going when you don't feel like you want to anymore or when other things in life pop up because it's inevitable and it's going to happen every time. But if you have a strong enough why, that will keep you driven to the very, very end so you can actually get this book done yet. We also talked about goal setting techniques. Hopefully you have taken some of the things you, you already outlined for your book in day one and started establishing goals, very specific goals for you to work toward in order to see your book come to completion and come to life. Um, and then of course, time management, how to actually carve out the time in your schedule, how to ask for help, how to, you know, try different methods that keep you engaged and keeps it fun for you, including rewarding yourself on a regular basis. So today we are really going to be focused more on that complete vision of becoming an author. Um, you know, it's one thing that early on, no matter like it, it never fails early on when I'm working with clients as we're just on the, in the writing process, they're already wanting to know more about publishing. Uh, I'm always like, you can't publish anything if you haven't completed your book, right? So that's step number one, no matter what. Yes, we're going into publishing today, but please remember you cannot publish anything if you don't have anything to publish. So please stay on track with making sure that you do complete that book. Um, but it really helps to have that overall vision of where you're headed, you know, especially if you did one of those goal setting techniques where it's more of the milestones that you want to reach from the time you take your idea to a completed manuscript, like, it helps you to see the big picture. Um, it's really important to at least know what the paths are and really figure out which one might resonate with you the most, might align with your vision and your goals the most. So again, we also hit on the owning being an author as part of your identity. Uh, are you noticing a trend here? Because it does make a difference. The first time I ran this workshop, there was a discussion about people struggling with not being able to identify with being an author, which is why I hit on it so much, because it's a game changer in your mindset and how you view what you're doing each and every day toward your book. Because every time you say it like, or allow yourself to think I'm not an author, you're telling your subconscious mind that, which creates a bigger and bigger gap that's harder to mend. Even if it's just telling yourself you're pretending to be an author right now, by all means, that's okay. Sometimes we have to pretend we are something before we are actually that thing. And there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. And the other thing I want to think about is that why are you so scared to call yourself an author? A lot of people are scared of what other people are going to think. Well, I haven't published a book yet, so they're not going to think I'm an author. Even if people have those thoughts, does it really matter? What's the worst thing those thoughts will do for you? Who else is going to write this story that you're writing? And who writes stories? An author, right? You're already an author of the story that you're writing. So be sure to continue to own that. 
Um, we're also going to talk about different ways to connect with your target audience. And like I said, we're going to dive into those publishing paths, the three different paths you can choose. So, and the pros and cons of, both, of all of them. So you can figure out what works best for you. And then we're also going to dive into a little bit, just skim the surface because there's so much you can talk about with this. What else you can do as a writer? How else can you, you know, make money off of this? Or how can you fully step into being an author and what it looks like? How can you take your message and do more with it? Make a bigger impact, uh, you know, put it into a movement. What else can you do? So we kind of talked about this already, but what does being an author look like for you? This is still part of that overall vision, especially once your book is completed. You know, what doors are you hoping that it officially opens when your door is available to the public? Are you wanting to collaborate with different organizations? Are you wanting to step more into the public speaking light? Are you wanting to, um, you know, be able to host webinars or workshops or conferences as a result from your book? So what do you fully want to do when your book is out to the world? Who are you wanting to connect with? A lot of people that we work with, because we are very impact driven here at Burning Soul Collective, a lot of people that we work with, they want to help as many people as possible. But who are those people? How are you going to connect with them? How are you going to make sure that your book gets into their hands? And we'll talk about a couple of things today. But then what is the ultimate impact that you want to make? What is like, what are you hoping that the book partially does on its own, right? I mean, you always have to be active with getting your book out into the world. That is one of the myths that we constantly have to overcome as an author. I mean, every now and then a book will take off without you having to do much, but that's rare. It doesn't happen much or it doesn't happen often. There's a lot of activity that has to go into a book and the impact that it's able to make, because it's all about how visible can you make that book so that it gets in front of the right people. So what is the ultimate impact that you hope the book itself wants to make? And what's the impact that you want to make as an author being active with the book as another tool that you're sharing with other people? I talk about this in different ways because we learn different things throughout this path. And that vision is continually getting more and more clearer. It's getting clearer with every single step you take, with every new thing you realize, with every new ounce of confidence that you take on, you get more clarity. So I bring it up because I want that to always still be where you're headed because you have to know where you're headed. You have to know why all of this is worth it. So let's go ahead and dive into the three types of publishing. Um, this is something that can get very detailed because there's a lot of different approaches even behind how am I successful in each one of these? How do I make it work for me? Um, we take a deep dive into these in the Soulful Author Journey Program um, because there are different paths, different things that you have to do to be successful. So there's a lot of information that that's behind it. But the thing is, like, the more educated you are, the more successful you will be, no matter what path you take. Um, so let's start off with traditional publishing. Um, this is the one that's been around the longest, right? Like, it, it was always there. This is how you get the book out to the world. Typically, what it starts with in today's processes is that you don't start necessarily with the publishing houses, but you start with literary agents and you research them, literary agencies. And then you look at all the agents, you look at what they're representing, what genres they're representing, learn a little bit about them, what they're looking for, what they're actively searching for, because most of them will put out requests, like I'm looking for this type of book specifically. So if you're writing it, like, send it to me, you know, um, but what the literary agents do is they find people that they want to represent, manuscripts that they truly believe in, and they will help you refine it, help you make it better, align it with whatever the market is needing, right? They see potential in your book. Maybe they think some tweaks can happen to really make it a very sellable book on the market. And then they take it and they sell it to publishing houses. 
to try to get your book officially published. So they are the ones doing the act of selling of your book to the publishing house, but you are trying to sell your manuscript to that literary agent. And then the publishing houses could take it from them and then make even more changes to your book, right? Um, based off of what they know and what they think will best appeal to the target audience. Um, in order to connect with the literary agent, you usually have to you know, write a synopsis, a query letter. You need to have a solid pitch. That's what I mean. You start it in the beginning. You want to nail it by the time you get to this point. Um, and then you start querying based on the requirements from each literary agent. Each one will have very specific requirements with what they're looking for. Maybe they just want an overall letter, maybe a synopsis. Some might want the first 10 pages. Um, each one has very specific individual requests. And it's important to be very detailed in this process because you wanna make sure you're sending them exactly what they're requesting. Otherwise it's a good way to be passed on just like that for not following directions. But you gotta think that these literary agents get tons of manuscripts, manuscripts queries each and every day. So they're looking for the quick way to toss one to the side, right? To find, to find the winner in the group. Um, the next step is if they like what you sent, They'll request your partial or full manuscript. They'll read through it. Sometimes they provide feedback. Sometimes they're just saying that they're passing. Um, or if you're lucky, they might offer you a contract. So that's typically the step with traditional publishing. Every now and then, you will get a publishing house that is open to anyone submitting a book. It's called open submission time. It's very, very rare. But every now and then it will happen. And it's starting to happen a little bit more because what will happen is like the big name publishing imprints or publishing houses will have all of these different side imprints where, you know, they'll start breaking down. Each imprint represents a very different subgenre. So maybe if one's a smaller or just starting out, sometimes they'll open it up to anyone being able to put in a submission without having a literary agent who does it for you. So the other thing, and we'll talk about this a little bit more with like earning royalties and stuff, but another thing with the traditional publishing is that when you have a literary agent, you know, you're paying them a percentage um, based off of like when your book gets picked up, right? Then they get a percentage of that deal. And then you're also essentially like the publishing house is going to be taking the majority of your royalties earned. And royalties are what's left over after your book sales um, from printing costs, shipping costs, and um, any sort of distributor costs associated. And then the publishing house will take the majority of the percentage of what's left from that. Even <laughs> We'll talk about this more in a bit. Self-publishing is when you own this entire process, okay? So yes, you're writing your book and having it edited and everything else, but you are also doing everything it takes to officially publish your book. So you are owning the process from choosing a cover designer, casting your vision for the cover designer to be able to create. You're taking care of the interior of your book. Um, you're formatting your book accordingly. So ebook, print, hardcovers, audiobooks, whichever formats you decide to go with. You're purchasing your own ISBN numbers. Uh, ISBN numbers are basically social security numbers for your book. Um, they're what go, they go into the ultimate book database and each one is assigned specifically to a format of your book. So like you have one ISBN for a paperback, one for a hardcover, um, and those can't be reused. Like once it's assigned to yours, that's it. The thing is, with self-publishing, there's a lot of pitfalls that you have to watch out for. One of them related to the ISBN. Um, you'll see things like on Amazon self-publishing platform, Kindle Direct Publishing, KDP. Um, you'll see that you can get a free ISBN number for, you know, if you upload on their platform. You don't have to take it. It's optional. A lot of people will take it because they don't want to buy their own. The thing is, when you do things like that, Amazon owns the ISBN number. Okay, and there are some things that I'm, I'm not going to go into the details here yet, unless we have time. And if you have questions, let me know. But there are things associated with like that Amazon ISBN number that prevent your book from being sold in a bookstore compared to if you owned your book or owned your ISBN number, you could have your book stocked in a bookstore. 
depending on the setting of the ISBN. So again, those are all things that we dive into in the self author journey program. If you have any questions about it, let me know. I'm happy to answer it. It's just a little bit more detailed than what I want to go into right now because there's so much more information. Um, you also have to take care of the copyright process, um, especially if you're in the U.S. Um, you have to develop your own street team, which is a launch team, building your mailing list, distribute arcs, um, ongoing marketing, spreading the word of your incredible book. I mean, you are solely responsible for it all. Now you can hire other people to help you with these things. Like you would probably hire a cover designer and, you know, so, uh, some of these other things, but you are leading it. Unlike traditional publishing where you have experts essentially taking the reins and guiding you self-publishing, you're owning it all. Like I said, there's pros and cons to all of this, which we'll talk about in a bit. Now, hybrid publishing is a mix of traditional publishing and self-publishing. You're, you're going to have what's called essentially small press publishers that will run the project of publishing for you. They're like project managers for your book. So usually you're paying them a fee um, and then they are handling the publishing of your book from cover design to ISBNs to everything else. And then you get your book out to the world that way. Now, there's something, and I don't know if we have it on a slide here, but there's something you'll hear called vanity publishers. And this gets confused quite often with hybrid publishing. Hybrid publishing is truly just another way to be able to help you. Like if you're just busy and you do not want to run the whole self-publishing aspect by yourself, but you really want a lot of the benefits of self-publishing, people will look at hybrid publishing because it's almost like hiring a full team who knows what they're doing and who will take the entire project from beginning to end. Um, vanity publishers are those who are truly out just for your money and not based on the success of your book or getting your book into the right hands of the readers. So what they will essentially do is charge you higher amounts just for putting your book on a platform and they're not really doing much else or they're not providing you with extra marketing support. And what do you do once your book's out there? Like then what, right? Because there's so much more than just publishing your book. I read once that there was like thousands of books published every single day on Amazon. So you can't just expect to publish your book, put it out there and expect for readers to find it. You have to be smart in the strategies, even from the time that the book is uploaded. Like you need to be very careful with the keywords used because all of it plays into the search engine, which is, you know, how readers will find your book. Like when they go to find, you know, books about, I, don't know, I just bought one about food prepping. So books about food prepping. Um, you want your book, if it's related to that, to pop up in the search. And if it's not uploaded correctly with the right category or with the right keywords, it won't be found. If the keywords aren't used and like your blurb on the sales page, it's going to have a harder time being found. There's a strategy that goes into it. And so if you go the hybrid publishing way, you need to verify that they know what they're doing and that they're not just out there for your money and all they're doing is uploading your book to a platform that they're actually providing you with full support. The other thing to watch out for is that a lot of vanity publishers will not only charge you up front to publish your book, but they'll also take a percentage of your royalties, um, which is a no-go. <laughs> that, that's a no-no. So don't do that as well. Um, but you want to make sure that if you do look at these, it's someone who fully supports you. They have the proof um, and they have happy customers that they are probably still working with. I mean, if the if clients are still going back to them, it's usually a, a good sign that they're safe. Um, just do your research, ask the right questions. It makes all the difference. So that's a high level overview of the traditional publishing, self-publishing and hybrid publishing. Now let's talk about the pros and the cons for each um, because this is really how you're going to choose which one you should go with. Take a sip of water. So if you haven't noticed already a theme, the question I've been asking every day so far is what is your ultimate vision for this book, right? What is your goal for this book? And we've been talking about this. Is your goal to reach bestseller status? Is your goal to earn as much money as possible? Is your goal to bring in leads for your business? Is it to uh, 
be able to collaborate with other organizations? Is it to, um, you know, entertain people? Like, what are your goals? And then you have to be able to rank them. What's most important? I mean, all of us want to be able to reach all of our goals, all of our visions, right, that we have set aside for our book. But you have to be able to rank what's more important because there are going to be decisions that you have to make during this process that are like, you know what? I'm okay if this one doesn't happen, if this goal doesn't happen, but I I need this goal. Like, this is my number one. This is what I want to achieve. Um, so let's talk about what that looks like. Um, so one of the factors to consider is the control over your book. If you are just so in love with your book, you feel like this is 100% the vision you have. You have such clarity in your vision. You feel like you've done all of this research with the target audience. You've, you've had beta readers who represent your target audience go through your book and they're just raving about it. They just think it's the best. Um, having control over that complete vision, especially if it's so clear in your head, especially if you've done everything that you know your book is just nailing exactly what you set out to do. Um, having control could be a really good thing. And a part of that, is going to um, leave you with the traditional publishing route. Because if you heard me talking earlier, like the process, like the literary agent who chooses to represent you, remember, it's a dual choice, right? It's not just, oh, they choose to represent you. You have to make sure it's a literary agent that truly sees your vision and they're going to fight for keeping that vision consistent, okay? So that's something else to think about. But Literary agents are going to have your book go through an editing process. They're going to make suggestions on how to make your book better. If your book then gets sold to a publishing house, they're also going to go through and give you suggestions, <laughs> changes that need to be implemented to make sure that your book is, you know, of course they want bestsellers, right? They want books that sell. So your book has the has the chance that it's going to change going through that process. You're going to start losing more and more control. They're going to know what the cover should look like. They're going to know what the blurb should say. They're going to have all of their opinions, expert advice and opinions. Um, but you lose more and more control over your book, right? You're, you're signing your rights of the book over to this publishing house. So that's something to keep in mind. They are the ones that determine the path of your book once it's in their hands. So I have several author friends who have gone down the traditional publishing route. And that's one thing they've always said is like, it just changed. Like the book changed in their hands. And now there's a lot of pros by going through the traditional publishing route. And we'll talk about that in a moment as well. But, um, you know, so if control is important to you, that's one thing to weigh. Self-publishing, obviously it's all in your control at that point. The other aspect is your team, meaning who are the people helping you bring this book to life? Um, again, traditional publishing, that publishing house, their team, they're the ones making it happen. It's not like you're getting to select specifically who is going to be on your team from that publishing house. If you are self-publishing, you're getting to choose. If you go the hybrid publishing route, the team is going to be in whatever small press publisher you decide to go with. And that's why it's important to interview them before you sign any sort of contract to make sure that they are the team that you want helping to bring your book to life. And then like some self-publishing, you do get to pick your own, but usually it's going to come from like a variety of different places, right? Like mostly it's going to be freelancers or like the cover design company over here. And then I'm going to use like, I don't know, a book marketer over here. I'm going to use an interior designer from here. Your team might consist of different people. Now, a perk to that that I personally love is that if you find, you know, you're, you're looking to write like four or five books and you find that you're just not happy with the result from one person, well, you can switch that person out the next time you go to publish your book, or you can change your timeline that you've set until, until that, you know, you find someone who actually meets your vision and carries it out. Um, bookstores, this is another big important part. A lot of people will say my ultimate dream is to see my book in a bookstore. 
Okay, the quickest way to do that, the easiest way to do that, I say easy, but if you go the traditional publishing route, they have those connections with bookstores already. They have the salespeople in place already. We're in the relationships in place where it's easier to have your book immediately stocked at a bookstore. Can it be done as an indie publisher, as a self-publisher? Yes. Can it be done through a small press publisher? Yes. Does it take more work to do those things? Yes. <laughs> and there are very specific techniques and strategies. One of them being you have to have a solid marketing plan, proof that your book is going to be sold and you're able to present that to the bookstores that you want them stocked in. Like you have to be able to supply proof for why your book will sell. And one of the things, I mean, that works both ways for traditional publishing and self-publishing, hybrid publishing, if you're looking to get your book stocked in a bookstore, um, traditional publishers, first of all, it's just, it's just the day we're in y'all. And a lot of aspiring authors hate to hear this, but they're going to ask, especially for nonfiction writers, what your social media platform followers, how many you have. They're going to ask about that. Um, big difference from like, I don't know, 10 years ago when I first started looking at traditional publishing, uh, that wasn't a question. Now it's one of the first questions they ask when you even submit your query for your book. Uh, they wanna know how big your following is because more than likely, especially if you're writing a book, that is meant for that, that main audience that already follows you, it increases the opportunity for sales, right? That is also going to be something that works to your advantage when you're looking at um, trying to sell these bookstores on stocking your book. So again, this is one of those where I almost feel like the pro goes more towards traditional publishing just because they already have those relationships um, set up. And that's where the books go that they take on to the bookstores. The other thing, I mentioned marketing plan earlier, having a solid marketing plan. That's one of the biggest myths um, in relation to publishing that I hear quite a bit is, well, I'm not a marketer. I, I don't want anything to do with marketing my book. I just want to write my book and be done with it. Y'all, even if your book is published traditionally, they're going to expect you to take part in the marketing of your book, Okay. And there's no escape from that. <laughs> no matter what publishing path you choose, you are going to have to contribute to the marketing of your book for helping it be visible by showing up and letting the world know that your book is now available and why people need to read it. There is nothing you can do to avoid that. Even if it's like interviews with the author or whatever it is, you're going to be expected to participate in that. And that's something that, again, we talk about oh, more so in the Soulful Author Journey Program, but it's that mindset shift, right? Don't look at it as marketing your book. Look at it like at celebrating that your book is out to the world. Being excited to tell the exact people that you wrote the book for that it's available to them and this is why they need to read it. I mean, you poured all of this time and energy into it. You got to celebrate it. You have to be the biggest cheerleader and you should be the biggest cheerleader of it. You should be, especially if you're darn proud of the outcome of it. And if you've done all the right steps, you should feel exactly that. Um, time is another one to consider. So if you're going the traditional publishing route, more than likely that whole process it will be one to three years before your book is available to the public. Okay, um, just because of the processes, what it has to go through to get to that point. And then not only that, but the time it takes to actually find a, a literary agent and then the literary agent to send it to or to sell it to a publishing house takes time, right? For all of that to happen. Um, Self-publishing, I mean, you know, guys, you could get it out there tomorrow. I don't recommend that. <laughs> it's one of the reasons why self-publishing got such a bad reputation when it first became available for people because people were just throwing books out. The books had not been properly edited. The covers were awful on it. 
And everything about the whole process was just done wrong. Now, there's a whole new generation of self-publishers now who, I mean, you'll look at a book and you can't even tell the difference between a self-published book and a traditional book, traditionally published book, because they've taken the care and the consideration they've invested in it. They've had their cover designers, the interior formatters. It's been through multiple rounds of professional editing from developmental line proofreading. Everything to it, everything done with it has been professionally done. Remember, this book is going to last past your time here in this world. It's not worth rushing it and doing a shoddy job and then being like, why is my book not selling? You have to take the time and care. You should care about it every step. You want it to, to be exactly that vision that you established. So I say that because, I mean, gosh, if you have a whole team in place that can work fast, then yeah, you can get a book out fast. Um, there are people who do that all the time. They have these systems that they go through and they will shoot out, you know, one book every two months because they have a system in place and it's a professionally done system. Um, but what we recommend, minimum, <laughs> is you should plan for like four to eight months, again, minimum, to go fully through everything required for self-publishing, including that pre-promotion period, like really drumming up the hype for your book before it's even released so that you have people hungry for it, waiting for it, wanting to read it. They're so excited once the book is actually in their hands and you know, sharing pictures of it on social media. And then that's reaching a whole new breadth of audience that you didn't have access to before. There's a lot of benefits to taking your time if you do go the self-publishing route. And the same thing with hybrid publishing. I mean, most of them should. Most of the official hybrid publishers and not just vanity publishers should have a very specific method process in place that's going to be anywhere in that four to 12 month range. Um, to get your book out so that way everything's done correctly so that it is a success once it's launched, right? Um, but again, if you're like, gosh, I really want my book out in the next year, self-publishing, hybrid publishing, going to be a better option than traditional publishing. Royalties, I hit on this a little bit when we were talking in the last slide, but definitely something to consider. Self-publishing, you're going to have 100% of the net royalties, uh, meaning again, what's left over after, you know, printing costs, shipping costs, distributor costs, distributors being like the platforms like Amazon or Ingram Spark that push your book out to different retailers. Um, they always take a percentage. Um, so when you're self-publishing, you get 100% of those, those net royalties, unless you have some sort of deal, like if you did children's book and the illustrator gets 50% of those, then that's a different situation, right? Um, but you have full control over whatever that looks like. Hybrid publishing, most hybrid publishing will charge you up front for all of the services that they are providing. Some of them might have some sort of deal where there's no upfront costs, but then you guys are splitting the, the royalty costs. So uh, traditional publishing, not an upfront cost. In fact, sometimes you might be given a what's called an advance. Um, and a, an advance is usually an amount of money that they provide to you in order to try to like win your book over. So you choose them as the publishing house, especially if it's one that seems like, you know, it could be very popular very quickly. Um, and the thing to keep in mind when it comes to advances, though, it's exactly that. It's an advance on what they are expecting some of those royalties earned to be. So you won't get additional royalties until like that evens out, right? And then you'll start getting royalties on top of it. So that's something that a lot of people don't realize. Um, so yeah, traditional publishing, you're usually going to take, if they'll take, typically it's like 85% of your royalties. And so you guys got to think this is already a small margin that's left over, right? From taking out printing costs, distributor costs, all of that aspect. Um, so you earn less, but like I said, there are trade-offs to that, right? Trade-offs to the fact that your book might be in 
bookstores all over the world. So that's what I mean by really setting up your values. Like what is most important to you? Is it to earn as much money as possible? Is it to be in bookstores? Is it to have like a team of experts? Is it not? I mean, like you have to figure out what's most important to you. And that is how you choose your publishing path. And then I have prestige here. Um, it's one of those things specifically with traditional publishers. That I means it's pretty cool to get picked up by a traditional publisher, right? Um, but if that doesn't matter to you, then, you know, choose a different path based off of one of these other factors. So there's a lot to weigh. I mean, like I said, there's pros and cons to every aspect. When you have that clarity on what do you want to achieve with this book, what is your ultimate goal? That's how you're able to choose which one of these paths best fit you. And that's what I have. <laughs> Only you can determine the best path for you. So make sure it fits your long-term vision and not just short-term gains, okay? That's something else I want you to look at. Really, a book lasts forever. I mean, one of the cool things about book, books is maybe it's not a huge hit when you first launch it, but in three years, maybe something happens and your book is suddenly at the top of everyone's list. That happens time and time again with books. So you want to look at not just what's going to happen the moment it gets out of the gate, but was that long-term vision truly like for your book? So let's talk about how to connect with your target audience to get your book in front of those people. So one thing you can look at is blogging specifically. A lot of people who have started off as like really popular first time authors like Glennon Doyle, for example, she's really big. She started off as blogging first and she built up that community before she launched her book, before she wrote her book. Uh, that's a really powerful way to connect with your target audience and also to see what's popular. I believe it was Malcolm Gladwell, who, um, I might be wrong on this, but I'm pretty sure it was him, who his books are written based off of his most popular blogs or blog posts. So he sees what's really resonating with the audience. And then he's like, all right, I'm going to take this and this and this to, to create this book, because I know this book is going to be a huge hit because all of these related articles were the most popular. Makes total sense. Blogging is so effective. It's just a great way to, to build up that audience before you officially release your book or write your book for that matter. The other cool thing about blogging is that even after your book's out into the world, you can continue to have that relationship with your readers. I mean, a lot of readers get attached to their author, to authors, right? I mean, especially if a book truly impacted them and changed their life, they want to stay connected with you. They want to see what else you're going to put out. Like they're already waiting for your next book. So blogging is a great way to really stay in front of them and to continue to cultivate that, that connection that personal relationship. The other cool part about blogs is that it really feeds into search engines. You're using a lot of those keywords that people are searching. That all brings people back to you as well. Blogs are very easy for people to share on social media, uh, to send to a friend. Blogging is powerful. It's super powerful. I don't blog, but as I'm talking about this, I'm like, yeah, this is why I need to get back into it. <laughs> um, social media posts, of course, is another great way. Um, what I really recommend social media posts is choosing like one or two platforms max. Specifically, one would, would really help you during this time, but two is okay as well. One that you know your target audience is at. And um, start really building that up, sharing your knowledge, sharing what you're passionate about, showing behind the scenes of the book that you're working on and start connecting with those people. Share some stories, some personal stories, like what we've been talking about, like the emotional connection with your audience so that they are waiting for what you're putting out next. They want to feel inspired, empowered. They want to feel like maybe someone has a solution. Or like I said, even if it's a fiction book, like being able to relate with um, the main characters of the book. Feeling like their life is reflected in the story that you're telling. There's so much you can do with social media on that front. YouTube, 
Um, I have outside social media. YouTube is really more like a search engine, similar to Pinterest. It's not really social media. It's more of a search engine, even though with YouTube, you can comment and interact with people a little bit more, but uh, it's all search engine based. Um, and it's the same thing where it can easily be shared. And then you have that live connection, right? I mean, you can do this on social media as well, but with YouTube, it's that, that energy that's being exchanged when they see you live and they see who you are and what you represent. So there's so much you can do in that as well. I mean, even if you're fiction, you can, you know, do book trailers or show behind the scenes or how you're managing things or talk to your audience about how the, how the main character was developed. And then if it's nonfiction, obviously all of those topics related to your book, you can just talk about or share information with or interview other guests and have that as your YouTube, similar to podcasts. You'll see a lot of podcasts that also use YouTube and social media for that matter, but the podcast is, of course, something that people can listen to on the go, on the road. Lots of people have their favorite podcasts that they tune into regularly. You want to make sure that the podcast is, of course, um, has a very powerful theme similar to your book. And maybe your book represents a sub theme, or maybe your book goes hand in hand with that overarching theme of your podcast. Um, but people will, you know, of course, like I said, podcasts are audio, but they'll record it as a video. And then that way they can put the video of the same podcast on YouTube. And then you're reaching two different audiences with one technique. Um, the more you can repurpose what you do, the more powerful your reach will be. So you got to keep that in mind. I mean, same thing when you're recording these podcasts. And if you do it in a video setting, like I said, you have the video then for YouTube, the audio for podcasts, and then you can take clips of it for social media posts. And when people hear the clips and they love what you're talking about, then they want to go listen to your podcast or watch the YouTube on it. So it all goes hand in hand. And that's the beautiful part. I'm really big into what can I do once and then repurpose. And that is the cool part about podcasts. Um, the, really, the goal is to focus on creating a community or creating an experience for your future readers. You want a community around your topic, your mission, your overall goal. And the other goal to keep in mind is to don't wait until you have something to produce, okay? Like a lot of people will be like, oh, I'll get in front of my target audience once I have a book that I can share with them. You're gonna be so much more effective and powerful when you're doing it in advance because then you're bringing people on that journey with you. And then each time you talk to one and network with them, you're gathering more and more stories, tools, things that you can implement in your, in your book, more topics that they need to hear about while building your audience at the same exact time. So it's never too early to start connecting and building with your audience. And you have to keep that in mind. I think one of the, <laughs> why it's so important to have like a strong structure and plot, like we talked about in like day one, is one of the worst feelings is after you publish a book and you're like, oh, if only I included that one point too. <laughs> I mean, the good thing is you can always do a second book, right? Or hopefully you have multiple additional points that you can add in. But, um, you know, that's why it's so helpful to do this while you're writing. It can really make a huge difference. So let's talk about fears. This is another big part. I, I, I talked about with the writing, like, when someone is about 80% done with writing their book, they freeze up. <laughs> it, it, like they, get, they freeze up, they get tired, they start to have all of these fears like rush through their mind. Um, it happens so consistently. It's just one of those things I expect now when I work with people. And it happens again, right before your book is officially published and shared with the world. Because it becomes more real then, right? Like for much of that writing process, it's been you. Maybe you've shared it with some beta readers to get early feedback. Maybe you've shared it with some loved ones, but now it's going out into the whole world. And so people start battling with their fears. Fears of not being good enough. Fear of what if I just did all of this work and the book never ever sells. Fear of what someone will say about what you've written. This comes up a lot with memoirs specifically. People are terrified to share their truth with others. 
fear of not knowing what to do or doing it right once the book is out there or maybe even during the publishing process. And the fear of the unknown, because who knows once you put the book out into the world, right? <laughs> who knows? The thing about fear, y'all, um, it will stop a lot of people. It will. People will slam on the brakes the moment they start to feel any sort of, you know, feeling uncomfortable or these fears or these worries, anxiety gets brought up. And if you're feeling fear at any point, it just means you're on the verge of something great. Every time I get terrified and I push through anyway, something really amazing happens on the other side of that. The other thing that comes up consistently when you put out a dream or a goal is it will suddenly seem like everything is working against it. I don't think I've ever worked with one client who hasn't suddenly had all of life come at them like an avalanche. Like all of these things suddenly stand in their way. Or they come down with a horrible sickness or their kids get sick or, you know, bad things happen. And they're like, I don't, uh, should I not be writing this book? Is this why? <laughs> Y'all, I'm a big believer that if that's happening when you're writing, it's probably because you have a powerful message that you're sharing with the world. And there's some resistance coming up because on the other end of that is true greatness. And the sad part is though, that's why there are people who never do it. And that's why great book ideas die all the time because people don't have a strong enough why for why they're writing this book to get through that, to burst through the fears, to burst through the obstacles. You might've seen that uh, we just had another speaker hop on, Jennifer Hobbs. She's going to be joining us or talking here in about seven minutes Jennifer, I'm already going to call you out. You don't have to pop on yet, but um, she can attest to this exact thing <laughs> for sure. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> um, especially on the other side, like what's the result and how it's worth it because of how you find out your book truly impacts other people. And I get emotional talking about your book, Jennifer, because it's a uh, already just with the short amount of time that her book's been out just thinking about what if certain people that she's had interactions with never read it how different then would they be today without that inspiration that encouragement that motivation from jennifer's influence from jennifer sharing her story and what she knows um so just remember fear is not a bad thing <laughs> If we are drilled in, we, we have it drilled into us, like it's something we should always avoid and run away from. And that is not the case. So speaking of Jennifer, there's a beautiful picture of her. <laughs> we also have Jul Julie Navikas. Um, she's going to be joining us in five minutes as well to talk about their paths of becoming an author. But here are just some of the other authors that we've worked with. Um, who, you know, did it. And like I said, every single one of them had something big come up the moment they declared that they were going to write this book and they kept pushing through to make it happen. And I share this and like with Julie and Jennifer talking here in a bit, because if they did it, you can too. Like that is the coolest part about us all being in this world together. If someone else had, if someone else does something that you want to be able to do, all they're doing is proving that it can be done. And I think that's what's so amazing about watching other people's journeys. Especially when you hear like what else they have on, going on in their life. It's like, it's not like no one has anything going on and that's why they're able to make these dreams come true. No, they have a lot, a lot happening in their life on a daily basis but they still push through because they want it that badly. So we've got about four minutes before Julie and Jennifer really launch or come on. So I want to go ahead and talk a little bit about once you've written your book, then what? Um, you really want to share your message far and wide, right? Like never stop promoting your book. Never stop telling people about it. You should be as energetic and excited about it five years down the road as you were, you know, the first week it was released. 
you want to speak on podcasts. Like there are so many podcasts that are niche to your specific area, whether that's fiction or nonfiction. Research those. Ask to be a guest. A lot of times people will put out like searching for guests for this podcast. Do you know anyone? Look for those opportunities. You can ask people to write as a guest on their blog if maybe you're not ready to have your own. You can submit written pieces to online and local media. You can speak at conferences and events, especially now that you have a book, like there's some credibility there. And when that book is done the right way with editorial reviews, reviews as a whole, uh, marketing plan, like all of that helps feed into your credibility as an author. How many reviews you have? Jennifer, I think, is well over 100 <laughs> reviews now because she's done the work in order to gain those reviews. Um, partner with organizations, brands, and fellow authors. Collaboration is powerful because it allows you to connect with other audiences that you didn't previously have access to. Work with local bookstores or bookstores all over whatever country you're in to hold events, book signings, and then secure book reviews from readers and esteemed reviewers or bookstagrammers. There are so many people out there willing to read your book, a copy of your book, in order to provide a review. So those are all things you can continue to do to drum up interest, hype, excitement about your book, and to never let it just fall to the background. It's an ongoing journey. It doesn't just end once the book is published. It's ongoing and it's up to you to lead that because you should be advocating for your book and the importance of it in the world because hopefully you're the biggest believer in it as well, right? So before we go into Jennifer and Julie, um, I wanna go ahead and talk to you about, for example, the promotion piece we just talked about. If you are looking at how do I go about doing this? How do I make this happen? What does that actually look like to be able to pitch my book to different media outlets? Or like anything we talked about with the writing on day one, like how do I actually structure this? Maybe using a different structure than the three act. How do I actually take it from there into publishing? What do I do if I wanna traditionally publish? How do I go about self-publishing? Like what are all the different steps so I can make sure that I'm not missing anything? All the way through promotion. We have our Soulful Author Journey program that walks you through exactly that. So the cool part is, is you have lifetime access to the course itself, taking you all the way from just having a book idea to fully writing it to complete a manuscript and then taking that to the next level. What do you do then with the beta readers, with editing it? What type of editors do you have? Take a look. What are the different editing styles and types? And then, like I said, taking it to publishing and promotion and past that. So you get lifetime access to that entire course. But what's really cool is that you also get 12 weeks of live group coaching where you are getting your questions answered the moment that you have questions about what do I do next or I'm stuck on this part or can I get feedback on my blurb or my pitch? Am I heading in the right direction? You get feedback and support in that all from book coaches, authors who have been there multiple times and can help you, can help shine light on every single step that you take. You also get a community of other writers who are exactly where you are today. So you guys can cheer each other on and see that progress that you all are making throughout those 12 weeks. And you get all of that, y'all, for, I mean, a 12-week program <laughs> And what's cool is that it launches September 5th, which takes us all the way into December. And I think this is really important because a lot of people started off the year going, I want to write a book this year. But then as we know, life gets in the way, right? Suddenly other things become more important than writing that book, even though that book is very important to you. This program allows you to dedicate 12 weeks to focus on your book so you can reach those goals that you set out to achieve at the beginning of the year. And there's still time to do it before 2023 graces us with its presence. Um, for attending this workshop, for being here with me for the past three days, you also get $200 off of the Soulful Author Journey program. You're gonna get an email um, sent out today reminding you of this. Um, it's only valid until midnight Saturday, 
August 27th to save $200 off the program. So please keep that in mind. If this is something that appeals to you, you want to take advantage of this deal, you can use Writing Machine 200 when you go to soulfulauthorjourney.com. And then you also get a free bonus, which is our 30-day writing challenge. Uh, this is a really fun program for me. I love it. It helps kickstart your book. So if you have yet to get started, this 30-day challenge will help you with a solid plan, structure in place to be able to write your book and get it done faster. So you get all of that for the Empire for Soulful Author Journey program. All right, it looks like we have Julie join us now. So we are going to hop into some author interviews. So if you weren't here for day one, um, you probably missed me talk talking about how Jennifer and Julie were both part of the original From Blank Pages to a Writing Machine workshop uh, two years ago, two and a half years ago, <laughs> somewhere in that, in that range. Um, and